Alright, All right, so I'm making this video to talk a little bit about how to calculate the uh, capacitance and potential difference of a coaxial cable. So in this picture, what you have to recognize here is that uh, these pluses represent a positively charged surface, cylindrical in shape with an, a radius uh, R inner here. Then these minuses out here represent negative charge on the outer surface of the cylinder, uh, radius that I call R outer. So we got a plus Q on the inside, minus Q on the in I'm sorry, plus Q on the inside, minus Q on the outside. So what we're going to talk about now is how to calculate the potential difference uh, between the inner and outer surface. And the reason for doing that is because if we try to calculate the capacitance of this, capacitance, oops, let's get a better color here. Capacitance is defined as uh, charge per unit voltage. So when calculating the capacitance of the system, it always boils down to trying to find the voltage. So because of the symmetry of the problem, Gauss's law would be a good way to try to um, analyze this. So we start by drawing a Gaussian surface. And that might look something like this. Now, this surface is a cylindrical surface. You always want to try to mimic the geometry as close as you can. And let's label the geometry of this. Let's say that, you know, this length here, I'll call little l here, and then this Gaussian surface has a radius I'll call r. Now, if I were to draw some electric fields on that surface, like at this point right here, electric fields point away from the plus and towards the minus. So an electric field vector at that point would maybe point something like this. And maybe at this point it might point like this way. And so forth. Now again, <clears throat> anywhere on the surface it's important that you recognize that the electric fields would be radially outward. The reason is this, because the electric field is very sensitive to the distance. Remember the field due to a point charge is kq over r squared. Well, the electric field at this point is due mainly to the charge in this region, and as far as this region is concerned, that's a cylindrical problem. Now, when analyzing these, another good thing to do is to draw some two-dimensional pictures that kind of help you uh, uh, visualize the problem. So I'm going to take a moment here. I'm going to draw another picture looking from this viewpoint of what this might look like. I think I'll pause the video while I do that. Okay, I'm back. So I've drawn this picture over here on the right, and what this picture represents is kind of what you would see looking down this axis here of this coaxial cable. So the blue represents the negatively charged outer surface. The red represents the positively charged inner surface. This radius, that'd be R inner. That would be R outer. And then this would be the radius R for the Gaussian surface. The dashed line represents the Gaussian surface. Now let me talk about all the vectors. In black here, I drew electric field vectors at different points on the surface. And then in green, I drew DA vectors at those points. Remember that the DA vector is always uh, radially outward, or normal to the surface. So now we're ready to uh, write out Gauss's law. So if I write out Gauss's law for this surface, Gauss's law is this, that the total flux through any surface which is the integral E dot dA over the entire surface is equal to 4 pi K times the charge inside that surface. Gauss's law is a very handy law for finding electric fields in uh, uh, for problems that are very symmetrical. So, you know, the trick here is evaluating the integral. And my Gaussian surface here has three different surfaces. It's got a side surface, another side surface on the right, and this outer surface. The flux through the side surface is zero because if I drew a DA vector on this surface, it would point to the left. And E dot DA would be zero anywhere, and that'd be true anywhere on that surface, whether we're inside here or out. Same thing on the surface on the right. So, 
We'd have E.DA is zero everywhere on this left-hand surface. E.DA is zero. E.DA is zero on the right-hand surface. And now we'll talk about the outer surface of this can. And that's why I drew this picture over here. You'll notice that the E and the DA, they're parallel everywhere on this surface, on the surface of the, on the Gaussian surface. So the E dot DA is just going to be E times DA. Furthermore, there's no reason for the electric field to vary anywhere along this circle, nor anywhere along this length. So the electric field is constant on this integral, so that means it can be brought out in front. I'll just keep writing the rest of it out. So E dot DA just ends up equaling 0 plus 0 plus E times the integral of DA. If we integrate DA on the surface of this can, we get its surface area, which is 2 pi r times the length. So the left-hand side of Gauss's law ends up equaling this where this little r is the radius of my Gaussian surface, this little l is the length of the Gaussian surface. All right, now we'll start evaluating the right-hand side. So we've got the 4 pi k. All right, now the q in here. The charge in Gauss's law is the charge only in the Gaussian surface. So if I look in here, there's charge in this region. We can define a charge density by taking the total charge q divided by the total length of my Gaussian surface. I'm sorry, not the Gaussian surface, the coaxial cable. If I take the total charge Q and divide by the total length of the cable, this will give us the charge density. And then we just multiply it by the length of our Gaussian surface. So now we have an expression here that we can just algebraically solve for the electric field. And if we do that, let's see, I think we get maybe 2k q over l times 1 over r, I believe. Let's see, the 2's cancel, the pi's cancel, k gets to stay, this stuff all stays. I think that's correct. So, this represents the electric field intensity everywhere between the charged conductor, the charged inner surface, and the charged outer surface. The electric fields equal this in magnitude and they point radially outward. Uh, notice that they fall off with r, not r squared, and that's because of the cylindrical symmetry of the problem. So I think what I'll do here is pause this for a moment, kind of clean this up, and then talk about how to use the electric field expression to calculate the poten uh, potential difference between the inner and outer surface. Okay, I'm back. Clean things up just a little bit. Uh, move my equation here for uh, the electric field strength within the conductors, or well, between the two conducting surfaces. Over here, clean this up a little. Now for the potential difference calculation. So, potential difference, the potential difference between any two points is minus the integral E dot dr from, let's say, point one to point two. So this is an example of uh, a path integral. So whenever you perform this integration, you always choose a path. I'm, and you know, typically you just choose the simplest possible path. So I'm just going to imagine starting right here, that's my point one. And then this integration is along this path outward to this point, point two. So we're gonna have the integral now. Now the integral is over r, that's my differential element. So this is gonna be the integral from r initial, or r1, I'm sorry, r inner to r outer. Now the electric field strength is 2k q over l times one over r, all right? Now, dot dr, when I look at this picture, the angle between the, any dr vector, the dr vector would point radially outward. The angle between radially outward and the electric field is zero, so e dot dr is just e times dr on that path. So, magnitude of e, magnitude of dr, cosine of zero gives me a one. So there's the dot product. And 
of course anything that's constant can just come out in front of the integral. The integral of 1 over r dr is natural log of r. The limits, now I got this minus sign to deal with. There's a couple ways we can handle that. I like to just absorb the minus sign into the limits. Um, or actually, now to tell you the truth, we'll just leave that out in front. And then this will be evaluated from r initial to r final. So what we're going to have here is minus 2k q over l natural log of r final over r initial. So this expression represents the potential difference between the inner and outer surface. Okay. The next step is to try to calculate the capacitance of the system. Well, capacitance is just charge over voltage. This represents the voltage difference between the inner and outer surface. Um, when you're calculating capacitance, the minus sign doesn't really matter. The minus sign just means this, that as we move from the inner to the outer surface, we are decreasing in potential. So the capacitance is going to be Q over V, and that's going to be Q over this expression. Let's see if i got enough room to write that all out. 2K Q over L natural log of R final over R initial. We don't need the minus sign, we just throw it away for this calculation because, the, again, the minus sign just tells us which surface is at the higher potential. You don't need that for the capacitance calculation. You notice the Q's divide out, this becomes a 1, and there's our expression for the capacitance of the system. So, uh, I hope that helps. The idea here is how to use Gauss's law to find the electric fields between uh, conducting plates. Uh, some common examples are cylindrical symmetry, but also uh, just parallel plate symmetry and spherical symmetry. So, everybody have a great day. See you soon.